Welcome to this CMS Pensions Lawcast. This is the first in a series of lawcasts looking at master trusts. And today's focus is on transferring to a defined contribution master trust. I'm Keith Webster. I'm joined today by my colleagues Katie Millard and Harriet Cleal. If we perhaps start with some background to master trusts. A master trust is now defined in legislation to mean an occupational pension scheme, which is providing money purchase benefits and which is used by two or more employers who are not connected to each other. And in most cases, master trusts have lots of employers who have no connection with each other at all, all of whom are effectively outsourcing their defined contribution pension arrangement to the master trust provider. There are three groups, three broad groups of master trusts in the market today. We have a group of auto enrolment providers who are offering auto enrolment compliance for what you might call the mass market. So for lots of employers, you need to have a scheme to offer to their employees in order to meet auto enrolment requirements. And so they're very much focusing on new contributions coming in for existing employees. The Second broad group, which is the one we're mostly looking at today, is consolidators. So these are master trusts who are taking transfers from existing defined contribution schemes and looking to build scale so that they can hopefully offer better value for money both to members and to employers. And then the third group is what you might call specialists. So there are some industry-specific master trusts and there are some what maybe you could call accidental master trusts where they're not really intended to be competing with this other group, but they happen to meet the test for a master trust in the legislation and therefore need to comply. And since 2019, in order to operate as a master trust, a pension scheme has to be authorised by the pension regulator as an authorised master trust. And the introduction of that authorisation regime led to a reduction in the number of master trusts in the market from 90 in 2018 down to 38 today, soon to be 36, as if a couple more merged together. But whilst the number of schemes has reduced, um, the size of the market has grown very rapidly. According to figures from Mercer, in 2018, there were 10 million members of Master Trusts and they had £16 billion worth of assets. Two years later, that had risen to 16 million members and a whopping £38 billion of assets. And this growth is largely due to the sorts of transfers we want to talk about today. Transfers from an existing occupational scheme run by a particular employer into a master trust. And we want to look at that transfer process, firstly, from the perspective of the employer. Secondly, from the perspective of the trustees of the transferring scheme. And then to pick up a few of the issues that might arise during the transfer process. And so to start, Harriet is going to look at the employer perspective. Thanks, Keith. So there's quite a few things to think about from the employer perspective. So I'm just going to go through, focus on three, choosing a master trust, participation, documentation and member communications. First of all, choosing a master trust. This is going to be an individual decision for different employers and there's different factors you might want to bear in mind. One of them is administration and governance. So as Keith mentioned, because of the TPR authorization regime, all master trusts have to meet a minimum standard. And this is a continuing obligation. So the pensions regulator has a supervisory role to make sure all authorized master trusts continue to meet this criteria. And that gives employers as well as members and trustees some reassurance that these minimum standards are met. There might also be um, your own personal as an employer requirements that you want to make sure they meet. For example, if you want to make sure they respond to queries quickly. Member communications is another important one. This will be letters and emails. And nowadays, especially with DC schemes, a lot of members will be getting a lot of their information through the website. So you'll often want to have a look at the website and see if it has any extra features you might be interested in. For example, a pension calculator to help members see their calculate their retirement benefits and see how much they should save. Fees is another important one. 
so both from the member and the employer perspective. And this is quite a big one, so I'm going to go into it a little bit later in terms of the participation documents, and Katie's going to look at it as well from a trustee perspective. Finally, investment choices is one to consider. So, for example, if you if your members in the current existing scheme have self-selected into an ethical fund, you might want to check that the Master Trust offers something similar so that members can self-select there as well, an option that they're happy with. So now that you've chosen your master trust as an employer, you're going to start thinking about participation. At this stage, I think it's worth taking a step back and distinguishing between participation and transfer. Sometimes they're done at the same time, but often there's a couple of months gap between the two. Participation is you stop contributing to the existing scheme and you start contributing in the master trust. So that only affects active members. You'll often have the two month gap and then transfer over. And that will be all the past accrued pots going into the master trust. So just for participation, the document you need is a deed of participation. And this will usually be the employer and the master trust provider signing. And the trustee won't usually sign this. There are a few key terms in the deed of participation you want to think about. One of them is provision of information. So what information are you being asked to give? Is that information readily available? Do you need to talk to the administrator of the existing scheme to make sure it can be done quickly and within the time frames expected? And also, are you being asked to warrant for its accuracy? You might want to consider a data cleanse as part of the process just to make sure everyone's addresses are up to date and so on. Indemnity is another key commercial term, and this is often negotiated to reflect the party's intentions and what they're happy with. Maybe a cap is included. Fees, again, a key commercial term. These might be in a separate charges appendix. The fees tend to come in the form of member or employer fees. So member fees might be a percentage charge on a member's pot, and employer fees might be a per member charge or an annual charge or both. While you're thinking about fees, you might also want to think about any extra services you want. So if you want that pensions calculator in the website, does that cost extra? Are you expecting that to be included? And if you're thinking about extra services in future, you might want to set out how you're going to agree the rates for them. While you're preparing to participate, you also want to think about member communications and also consultation. So for the participation step, you usually will be required to consult as you'll be ceasing accrual in the existing scheme. And this will trigger a requirement in the regulations for 60 days consultation with all affected members. Change in contribution rates, if you're changing as you go across, may also need consultation. The transfer itself doesn't usually need consultation, doesn't usually trigger the consultation requirements, but it is important to give a good member experience. So you are going to want to make sure you're telling members, giving them all the information about the options they have and make sure they know what funds they might be able to invest in, when they can, if there's a blackout period and so on. And the member communications is an area where the trustee will tend to get quite involved as they'll be interested in reviewing the documents as well. This is a good time to hand over to Katie, who's going to take you through from a trustee perspective. Thanks, Harriet. Trustees need to consider whether they're technically able to transfer benefits, whether or not they should do so, and any potential issues which must be resolved before doing so. They need to be satisfied that they have the power under the provisions of the scheme and relevant legislation to make the transfer in the first place. Transfer out rules differ from scheme to scheme and can take the form of a company direction, a joint power between company and trustee, a sole trustee power, or the rules can be completely silent on this point. Trustees need to identify who has the power and amendments may be required if the rules are silent or if there are restrictions in the rules. Preservation legislation permits the transfer of members' benefits to another scheme without their consent, provided that certain conditions are met. The legislation previously required an actuarial certificate in respect of any transfer. This was then amended to allow a DC to DC transfer without a certificate, but with independent advice. Since the introduction of the Master Trust authorisation regime, there is an alternative route whereby the legislative test is met if the transfer is to an authorised Master Trust. This doesn't mean that trustees will not need to take advice, just that the independence requirements do not need to be met. There might also be scheme specific issues with the benefit structure on investments, which act as practical hurdles as to why a transfer cannot take place without changes being made. 
there may also be specific requirements in the rules, for example, a particular form of, of actuarial advice is required. The next question is then whether or not the trustees should carry out the transfer. Trustees must act in the interest of the beneficiaries of the scheme. In the context of a DC scheme, this in effect requires trustees to act in their financial interests. Generally, trustees will want to ensure that the terms of the transfer and the benefits provided by the master trust are satisfactory, and the resulting position of the beneficiaries is broadly no less favourable. Trustees should take relevant advice and ensure that they fully understand the consequences of the transfer and have carried out all relevant due diligence. The need to consider whether or not master trust is an appropriate vehicle to receive members' benefits, including looking at the terms of the master trust, including the balance of powers, and compared with the existing scheme. Any material differences in benefits or the way in which members can access benefits. The master trust investment arrangements in which funds members' benefits will be transferred into, the charges that members will then have to pay, and also the security of members' rights under the master trust following the transfer. The structure of a master trust means that from a governance perspective, there'll be trustee oversight of members' benefits. It's gone through a comprehensive authorisation process with the pensions regulator and remains supervised. This usually provides trustees with comfort that members' benefits will be properly looked after. The Department for Work and Pensions published guidance at the end of 2018, which was aimed specifically at the DC to DC transfer process under the independent advisory to pose general applicability to master trust transfers. Although it's guidance, we'd expect that any trustee board would wish to consider the guidance and, so far as possible, comply with it as it sets out what is seen as best practice. Next, a key consideration for trustees will be whether or not the master trust offers favourable investment options compared with those currently available to members under the scheme. Trustees should take investment advice and advisors are likely to come up with a proposed mapping of various existing investments into new funds. Members in default arrangements currently protected by the charge cap will continue to be so post-transfer. Where members have made an active fund choice, trustees are free to exercise their discretion as to which funds the transfer should go into, but should usually base their choice on the similarity of funds and comparative value for money. Costs will be a key consideration. A member is going to be expected to pay more. This may be due to members not currently meeting all costs within the existing scheme. For example, if the um, employer subsidises such costs or the default or other funds in the master trust have slightly higher charges. It's not the case that exact mirror funds are required or that a slightly higher charge in certain funds would necessarily preclude any transfer. Investment mapping should generally be considered in the round. Master trust providers will also be careful to ensure that funds don't inadvertently become effective defaults on the transfer due to the way that legislation works when members have not self-selected in the past five years. Separately, members could encounter transaction or other charges as part of the transfer process. Trustees may wish to request that the company subsidise these charges so that members are not worse off or agree commercial terms with the provider about these costs. Finally, trustees will need to consider the actual mechanics of the transfer and whether the member will be exposed to any out-of-market risk and for how long. In such circumstances, it's common to enter into a pre-funding agreement to reduce any such risk. Trustees will agree a transfer deed. This is an agreement between the transferring and receiving schemes trustees and in some cases, the relevant employer. It will set out the scope of members transferring and any conditions for transfer. Warranties will be required by the master trust trustees about the transferring scheme and the benefits within it. This will include disclosure of information to ensure that the master trust has all of the data it needs and that it is correct. As Harriet mentioned, a data, a data cleansing exercise might be useful. Master trusts will want to take on straightforward DC benefits only, and they will therefore include warranties regarding irregular benefits and tax protections to include, ensure that there are no surprises. Trustees will also want to ensure that they've got relevant protections written into the transfer deed. This will include the discharge of liabilities in respect of transferring members and assets. And it's also common for trustees to request an indemnity for the employer, in particular when the transfer is at the direction of the company. Finally, in respect of member communications, a basic level of information is required to be provided to members regarding the transfer under legislation, with one month's notice to be given to each relevant member. The guidance then outlines additional information that should be provided, such that it is good practice for trustees to notify members in writing of the fund in which they propose to transfer them into, and the members should have a point of contact for any queries. Keith will now talk you through some common issues which often arise and how they can be addressed. Thanks, Katie. The 
first group of issues we want to look at relate to members' benefits, and there are sort of three groups to look at here. The first is there are two types of tax protection under the current tax legislation which could be affected by a transfer to a master trust. The first is what's called protected pension age, and this is that there are some members who had a right before the 2000 tax regime was introduced to retire before the current minimum pension age of 55, and they have a protected right to carry on retiring at that earlier age. The second tax protection is for those members who in 2006 had a right to a lump sum at retirement of more than 25%. And again, they could protect that right to the higher lump sum. Those protections could be lost on a transfer to a master trust unless the transfer meets conditions in the legislation to be a block transfer. And in order to be a block transfer, there are four broad conditions. The first is all the rights of the member in the arrangement which is transferring have to go to the master trust. Secondly, that transfer has to be a single transaction. It needs to involve more than one member. And the protected member in question cannot have been a member of the master trust for more than 12 months before the transfer takes place. Now, in most cases, that will be quite easy to meet in relation to a master trust transfer. There's a little bit of risk with that 12 month requirement. Um, Harriet mentioned you could have a gap between when the members start participating and when the transfer happens. If for some reason that starts getting longer and longer, you can start running up against the 12 month period. There's also a small risk in a master trust that a member could just happen to have been a member of the master trust before because they worked for a completely unrelated employer. And that could in turn cause problems with the block transfer condition. But in most cases, you can meet those requirements and carry the protections across. The second aspect, which is also linked actually to tax free cash on retirement, is what to do if you have scheme members who have both defined benefit and defined contribution entitlements in your scheme. And they use the defined contribution pot to provide a lump sum at retirement rather than commuting pension for cash. That can be quite a valuable option for members. And so trustees who are looking to transfer to a master trust sometimes worry whether the loss of that option is something that the members would not want to suffer. Obviously, once the money has gone across to the master trust, it's in a completely different scheme. So you can't, from those two schemes, combine the retirement lump sum. But there are a few providers who will allow you to set up a transfer back facility so that when the member comes to retire in your existing scheme, they can ask to transfer some of their master trust pot back to your scheme and use it to fund their retirement lump sum. That's obviously an extra process. Um, it's something that might seem a good idea to start with, but maybe in 10 years time, perhaps you're trying to wind up your scheme, proves to be not really worth having. So think about it carefully before putting that in place, but sometimes it is useful to have that sort of option. The third benefit issue to think about is if you have any defined contribution members who have a, an underpin to their benefit. The most common scenario is where people were contracted out with guaranteed minimum pensions, but they had defined contribution benefits generally. So they have a DC pot but with an underpin equal to their GMP. And as a general rule, a master trust provider will not accept these sorts of benefits. So you have to work out what to do with members in your scheme who have them. Obviously, one option is just to leave them behind in your scheme and carry on running them as, as you do. Um, but the reason for transferring to a master trust is quite often driven by a desire to get away from all the current defined contribution governance obligations that trustees face. And so if you keep these behind, you may find you end up still having to do all that defined contribution governance. So you might want to look at alternatives such as perhaps trying to buy out those underpin benefits with an insurance company. The second group of issues to look at relates to investment matters. And Kate has already talked about some of the important issues to think about when looking to transfer to a master trust from an investment perspective. But I wanted to pick up on two specific issues in particular. The first relates to 
what are termed gated funds, which is an issue we've seen over 2020 due to the, the COVID problems. A gated fund is where the investment manager is currently not allowing money to be withdrawn from the fund because the underlying assets cannot be cashed in. And if you've got a gated fund, you can't sell those assets and to transfer the cash to the master trust. So you have to work out what to do. One option, and essentially the, the, the main option available, is actually you, you keep those funds behind and you make a staged transfer. So when the money is eventually released from the gated fund, you then pay that across to the master trust at that point. And that's generally OK, although you just need to think about the condition I mentioned a minute ago for tax protection, where a block transfer has to involve a single transaction and make sure that staging doesn't invalidate that protection. The alternative is, in some cases, you might be able to persuade the master trust provider to actually accept a transfer of the investment fund itself so that they take it on in its gated status. And then only when the gating is lifted will the master trust provider then sell those assets and transfer them into the master trust's own funds. The second group of investment issues are if you have special funds in your existing scheme that you need to work out how to deal with. These might be funds with guaranteed investment returns or guaranteed annuity rates that could be valuable for members, or funds who have, for historic reasons, very low charges, which the, the master trust funds can't match. And so you need to work out how to, to manage that issue. It may be that the employer would agree to compensate the members for the loss of those guarantees. It may be the employer will meet the difference in the charges to, to protect the members, or maybe the provider will be able to do a deal for, for those charges. If you can't do that, the trustees need to look at the whole transfer and work out whether it is in members' interest. And this is really key to the whole process. You need to try and identify all these issues at the start of the process, work through them with your advisors and see how you can resolve them. And ultimately, you need to work out whether you can get comfortable that the advantages of transferring to a master trust and all that that master trust can offer your members outweigh any of these perhaps minor differences and put that all together and confirm that the transfer is actually in your members' interests. So that's all we're going to cover today on transferring to a DC master trust. I hope you found that useful. Our next CMS Pensions Law cast is out in two weeks' time and is looking at liability management. And please watch out for further episodes in our Master Trust series, which will be released in the new year. Thank you very much for joining us.